waiting until everyone arrives or at least uh, most of the people that uh, registered and then we'll start in a minute. We had a quite a large number of registrations, so we're very happy that uh, the community around the Zero Project and beyond uh, is joining today. It's a pleasure to have you. Yes, thanks. I see that Maria has been sharing. So please share, uh, say hello and share in the chat uh, where you are uh, coming from, where, where you participating from. Uh, today is uh, in webinar style, so you won't be able to unmute or to start your video. Uh, but we will make sure that you can also interact with us via the chat. Hi, Dorothy. Um, yeah. So I would say, uh, let's start. Uh, other people uh, might come in, uh, might come in uh, as we go. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, wait a second. Uh -huh. So now to the official welcome uh, to our brand new webinar series for the Zero Project Impact Transfer Program. We've been doing this uh, for the first time in a, in, in a public way. Uh, the program itself exists since six years and together with the Zero Project and its global community, uh, for and with people with disability, we created this program to help organizations in the field of disability and inclusion to scale their impact and their innovations internationally. And we thought it would be a good idea to share our core contents uh, with you, uh, uh, our community. And thanks so much for participating today. The first webinar today is, as I said in the beginning, on impact models. Uh, uh, why it uh, makes sense to explore your impact, measure it, and also report it. Uh, so welcome to this first webinar. Uh, this is just the first one uh, in a long series. So uh, we will have a second webinar on social business models and fundraising uh, in November. In December, we will go on to global scaling strategies. And uh, on 18th of January, we will have a, a particularly uh, entertaining a module on how you present your innovations uh, and how you pitch your innovations with a, a voice, body, and speech uh, coach. You will find all this information on our webpage. Uh, we will also share this after this webinar with all of you. So let me introduce uh, myself first. Um, my name is uh, Alexander Kesselring uh, from Ashoka, from the Zero Project. Um, and I'm program coordinator of Zero Project Impact Transfer, and I will be a host today. Uh, I would also like to point out two features that we have in this webinar uh, before I introduce the speakers. The one is live captioning. So uh, on, on the bottom of your page, you can turn on live captioning and you will be able to read everything I say. And I hope this should work. <laughs> Maria Matek's support can maybe um, confirm. Uh, and we also have translation from English to Spanish available. So you can, uh, at the bottom of the page again, you have your interpretation feature. And there you can go to Spanish and you will hear a simultaneous uh, interpretation of what we are saying. I think this is particularly important as we have many participants also from Latin America. Hello to you. Um, so uh, let me start introducing our speakers for today. We're very glad to have them. Uh, first uh, of all, there's Gesa Kops uh, from Germany. Uh, she's the uh, head uh, CEO of the Institute for Inclusive Education. And she will today present what they are doing and how they uh, explore and measure and report their impact. And we are particularly happy that she brought uh, Laura Schwerer with her. Uh, Laura Schwerer is a pedagogical uh, expert uh, for the Institute for Inclusive Education. So she is one of the uh, people uh, that received the training um, as a person with disability and now is working at the university and she will share her experiences. And we're also very glad to have with us uh, um, Jalot Butkus from Fineo. Fineo is an impact agency with a quite uh, long history and track record already that helps social enterprises to uh, measure and report their impact. We will hear more from her in our plenary discussion. 
So um, I already mentioned some of the rules. Uh, the recording is on today uh, for the inputs. Uh, your video is off, your audio is off, so you can interact with us via the chat. We have live transcript, English to Spanish interpretation. You can use the chat for questions and saying hello to others. And we will also follow up with a mail um, where you, you know, where we capture uh, the insights. Wait a second, I have a technical issue here. One moment. Very sorry, <laughs> running low on battery. Um, yes, we will uh, follow up with a mail that will feature the key information, uh, uh, some resources that you can use for impact measurement, and we will also answer some questions uh, from the Q&A maybe later on. Um, we're done with the welcome and introduction. We will see the presentation for the, uh, of the Institute for Inclusive Education in a second and their impact journey. Uh, then we will have a plenary discussion with Geza and Charlotte on impact and impact measurement. And then we open up uh, to you, the audience, for Q&A by using the chat. And then I will inform you briefly, maybe again on upcoming webinars. I only have one introduction slide on impact before we go into action. Uh, that's the impact staircase and I took the liberty to use uh, the one from Fineo that they have in their social impact navigator. The impact uh, staircase is a good starting point to think about impact uh, and uh, three levels, you know, uh, it starts with the outputs and the outputs uh, are basically the activities that you implement as an organization. Um, and you can see uh, if the impact, if the activities have been carried out correctly if you reach the target group and if the target group accepted the offer. But that is not yet what we mean by impact. So the next level uh, is called outcomes. And this refers to the actual changes that you want to create uh, for your uh, practitioners, uh, for your target groups. And there are basically three levels. Uh, you start maybe by changes in attitudes uh, and new skills. Uh, you, you start, you go on to create changes in behavior, and then you may even change the living conditions of a person by what you're doing. Uh, and there's a final level called impact, how society actually changes at large based on what you and maybe other similar uh, projects, social enterprises, NGOs contribute. So this is just a brief intro on a topic today. And now I would already uh, like to hand over uh, to my first guest. We'll stop sharing uh, now um, and we will pin Geza. Give us one second. Hi Geza and please also uh, Laura Schwerer, yes. her colleague. Great. Geza, uh, you're already starting uh, your presentation. That's great. Uh, but please uh, tell us a few words on yourself and uh, your colleague. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Gesa from the north of Germany, Kiel. I have the pleasure to be the managing director of the Institute for Inclusive Education. My colleague, Laura Schwörer, will introduce her later on, I guess. Um, she will give a perspective of the educational specialist, because what are we doing? The Institute for Inclusive Education developed a qualification for people with so-called intellectual disabilities in order to teach at universities so that future students get inclusive competences firsthand from the experts in their own course. Our approach is focusing on the competencies of people with so-called intellectual disabilities. So universities get more inclusive. Our vision is that people with so-called intellectual disabilities are co-creators within universities, within the university world and that they gain access to tertiary education. Our mission is to remove barriers in the minds. Our qualification 
is uh, three years full-time qualification. It targeted six people with so-called intellectual disabilities so that they learn to give seminars. Laura, may I ask you to tell us why did you apply for the qualification at an educational specialist and what was it like to take part in the qualification? From 2009 to 2013, I took part in a former project that would later become the qualification to educational specialists. At that time, we were looking for interested people who could imagine preparing and conducing seminars for students of social work at the University of Applied Sciences in Kiel. This former project was called My World and enriched me very much. There were about 10 participants and three assistants. This project was organized by a social worker who worked in the workshop where I was employed at the time. In autumn 2009, the first seminars took place and my heart began to glow with joy. Of course, the project My World was not yet professional, but even when I was hoping it would become prof professional. This happened in 2013 and people with disabilities from the original workshop could apply for the project Inclusive Education. Six places were available. I applied and there were exciting interviews. I was very happy when I was accepted, accepted for the educational specialist qualification. Learning during the qualification was very easy for me. Unlike when I was at school, I was not afraid of learning. I learned many important things about participation and equality. The work and educational system and how to carry out educational work. In the qualification, we also learned how to tell students and other participants something about our educational path, experiences, in cultural areas and more to show what barriers we had and what was already going well. During the qualification, we already gave our first seminars and lectures. That was still very exciting for us at the time. When in 2016, the qualification was over and the six new educational specialists entered the general labor market. Thank you, Lara. And may I ask you another question? How does your work life, an average work day look like nowadays? We work eight hours a day during the week, of course, there may be exceptions, for example, when we have a seminar in the evening or an event at the weekend. We usually give, uh, we usually, usually give seminars in pairs. An assistant joins us. For lectures, we are usually many people, sometimes there may be only one educational specialist at an event, for example, for interviews or meetings like this one here. When we don't give lectures, seminars, workshops or interviews, we prepare upcoming app appointments or attend training of our 
of our own to develop our knowledge. So now I tell something about the way the work has changed my life. I became more independent and earn my own money now. I feel fulfilled because I can cont contribute more to society. So I have more possibilities in my leisure now. I am glad about the way that we students and other participants of seminars something about inclusion for their future so that they can work better with pupils or other people later. Because, the, because of the qualification and our job, me and my colleges feel self-confident, content, independent, and more reflected. And the power of inclusion makes me rock. Thank you, Laura. Those are the six educational specialists in Kiel. But Laura and her colleagues are not the only ones anymore. There are more. One, one big systemic breakthrough, the six first educational specialists in the world gained when this year in January, we became part of the Kiel University. So now we are a central unit at the university. Down on, on the right side, you see Institute for Inclusive Education. We are very proud that this happened this year. So before we were a social limited nonprofit company and Laura and her colleagues are now employees at the university. So people with so-called intellectual disabilities are now working as teachers at a university. As I said before, the first worldwide educational specialists are in Kiel, but they are not the only ones anymore. We scaled the idea, so we implemented other qualifications at universities. And from now on, as you see, I, I put three anchors, which should say and uh, visualize that there are six people at each anchor place where are also jobs are created at universities. And the small ships are still in progress. So the qualification is still going on. Um, and we hope there will be more. We are in, in planning of other new locations to implement more and more educational specialists within this university system. So as I said, our roadmap is to implement more educational specialists. Also within Europe, we will, Laura and me, we will travel to London next month in order to talk to universities in United Kingdom. But we also want to move into other sectors. So we would like to qualify people with so-called intellectual disabilities to become special specialists in nursing, digitalization, and so on. On the long run, we would like to be a federal institute. So to go ahead with mainstreaming inclusion, mainstreaming disabilities, within the university world. The social challenges are, as you all know, that the fear of contract is a major challenge preventing the participation of people with disabilities. But people with disabilities belong in the center of society. So it's not only the United Nations who call for inclusion, as it is a human right. Our target groups, uh, let, let me go here to thank you, Alexander, for the introduction on output, outcome and impact. I would like to present here that our networking is um, 
on the output level is that we network and connect with up to 200 stakeholders within the fields of science administration, politics, and experts on disabilities. And we reach them directly in order to implement our projects. Hence, the outcome is that we offer, we have more offers for people with disabilities at universities. For example, the qualification for educational specialists at universities in Germany. And the universities provide jobs which are funded via public. So with us, for us, is an inherent part of cooperation with tertiary educational systems. And at universities, people with so-called intellectual disabilities are seen as role models and as competence holders regarding, so here we are in realization of the UNCRPD Article 8, the awareness of the competency of people with disabilities from people without disabilities. The qualifications, so Laura told us about, she did a three years full-time qualification in order to learn how to teach at universities, how to talk about her own intellectual disability, how to, how to go on eye level with students, this is what we planned by 2025 at 10 locations in Germany. So we would like to establish 60 qualification places for educational specialists. So they change from a factory workshop to the tertiary systems, tertiary educational system. They gain more professional competencies and on the pers personality development, they are more self-confidence, they increase their leisure activities and so on. And again, we have the same impact as I already said before. I think Laura already visualized this quite nicely in order to rock inclusion. And, and the educational offerings carried out by educational specialists, reach so in all educational specialists in Germany reach up to 10,000 students directly each year. Hence, people without disabilities practically understand how inclusion works. They develop appreciation of abilities and skills of people with disabilities and they develop a professional attitude towards people with disabilities. So how do we measure impact? We can say that six educational specialists in Kiel reach up to 5,000 students per year who take these inclusive mindsets to their fields of work. So for example, Lena, a student, a future, future teacher, when she met Laura and her colleagues, this mindset, this experience, she will take with to her teaching life. So within the next 30 years, she will teach children and she hopefully has a different attitude and mindset regarding people with disabilities. How do we measure it? Regarding the educational specialists, we, we are external ev ev evaluated by a company called Value for Good. They, they take quantitative and qualitative data by interviewing the educational specialists in all the locations within Germany in order to get to know how many people um, applied, how did the personal situation differ from the beginning of the qualification and then with the job jobs which are created. So the changing from the workshop work to the educational work at university, what happened with the, with the people with so-called intellectual disabilities. 
We also have our own research. So one of my colleagues is doing research on the development of competencies. She is uh, interviewing also all the educational specialists with a focus on life competencies. So how many people left, for example, um, left the, the living situation, changed the living situation, moved out home, moved to live on their own, how many people now after finishing the qualification managed to use less assistance from, from state assistant. This is like what we are looking on. It's still work in progress. So I can't give you figures right now regarding the change, but the first um, draft regarding our external evaluation shows that we are doing quite good. So, so people in Germany who are working in, in sheltered workshops, the, 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 the rate of changing to the general job market is less than 1%. We managed that six people all did the qualification, six people. So 100% from finishing the qualification changed to the university to work at universities to be on the general labor market. Agesa, just one comment, please uh, wrap up. It's one minute to go. Thank you. No worries. Um, I want to show you the people who are employed at universities right now. So next to Kiel, there are three other locations where people now are working at universities. On the left, you see a Cologne. They just signed their working contracts last week. So we have to celebrate this. Um, yeah. And how do we measure our impact regarding the students, the people without disabilities? We have quantitative statistics. So as I told you, we keep track how many students we reach via the seminars, lecturers, and so on. And since we're at the university, there's a PhD position who will take a look on how the mindset might change within the students. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Time is running as always. I could tell you so much more. I'm looking forward for the questions. And that's what the Institute for Inclusive Education is doing so far regarding impact and measuring impact. Thanks so much, Gesa and Laura, for this uh, insight into your work and also the impact measurement. Um, great. Maybe you can uh, stop the screen sharing, uh, Geza, because we will now go on to our plenary discussion together with Charlotte. And Laura, uh, I say goodbye at this stage to you. Please, you know, stay with us in the call. And I ask Charlotte to join the stage. Here she is. Uh, great. So we uh, plan to have a bit of a discussion around the topic of impact. We have three guiding questions. So we will kick it off and then uh, the audience uh, can share, uh, you can share your questions and you can also start to share uh, as we are talking. Um, so my first question would be for Charlotte and please Charlotte also introduce herself uh, a little before answering the question. Um, in impact assessment, we often need to meet very different expectations uh, and goals. You know, there are funders, stakeholders, implementation partners, people with disabilities we work with, our own organizations and teams. So the first question would be, uh, in your experience, how is it possible for a social enterprise or an NGO to, to have an orientation regarding all these expectations? Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say hello to the audience. Um, I'm glad that you uh, in, invited me here as an expert in um, impact analysis. I work with Fineo, um, and one of our tools that we use most is the impact staircase that uh, Alex has used in the introduction. And um, to answer your question on 
um, how to keep those different and maybe also conflicting um, interests of, of different stakeholders in mind, I would um, advise you to really make, first of all, clear what you want to achieve. Um, I think Giza showed very well how what their objectives are and what their goals are. And um, it is for you, if you have a social startup and want to you know, do good, um, very good to um, make explicit what you want to achieve on different um, steps towards uh, impact. And if you can do that, you can also make um, clear that maybe after a year, you will not be able to you know, change society as a whole, but you uh, maybe be able to achieve the first steps in educating or uh, uh, supporting um, uh, your, your the, the persons you work with. So um, uh, making clear what you want to achieve is, or make uh, um, is like the first step uh, to also um, managing expectations. Thanks so much a lot. I would ask uh, Geza, in, in your case, why did you start to look at your impact or to measure it and um, who do you address? Um, thank you. We noticed that people are like they're, they're really this, the fear of contact regarding people with disabilities. We want to get rid of this. We want to create encounters in order to remove barriers in the minds. And of course, we need it not, not also to our uh, supporters, we needed to see how we can do this and how can we improve. So this is why we needed indicators how to measure impact. And this is how we came up like intentional, we wanted to reach people without disabilities in order to get inclusive competencies. Unintentional, the people with disabilities got jobs and there was so much happening in order to, like, like what I said, self-confident, less assistance and all this. So this was the point actually, it was from the beginning on that we thought, okay, we need to measure what we are doing and how we, are, how we are impacting. And our target groups are like at first future uh, students, future teachers who will in their future life and their work life get in contact, get in touch with people with disabilities and perhaps really don't know how to. So this is the target group. And again, we want to remove barriers in the minds. The other target group are people with disabilities who are in sheltered workshops and want to work at universities. And we need educational. Education is the key to everything. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe one question. Of course, you provide a three-year like full-time training. There, there are costs attached to it. So how important is the impact measurement to kind of uh, argue that these costs are necessary. Is, was it also on your mind when doing the impact measurement to argue towards funders that this makes sense? Sure. It, it has to be, um, there, there have to be indicators because the founders of founding is for six people is quite impressive. Like we need, the costs are quite high for six people to be qualified in a three year full time qualifications. So, of course, people are wondering, six people, but then, as I showed you, the multiplier effect, six people are reaching 5,000 students directly who then will take this mindset to their firmer workspaces. And this is, I think, this is the one that, that persuades our founders, our supporters. Thanks, Giza. This brings us to the second question. Uh, which is related. So what can be measured and what cannot be measured? So we're seeing uh, social enterprises that have impact models that are rather long-term, as in your case, for instance, right? You invest, but then these people work for, for many years in the university sectors and reach uh, thousands of students. So they're long-term impacts, but they're also sometimes very deep impacts on a personal level, on the level of personality that might not be easy to measure. And of course, just the topic, how do we measure impact 
uh, for and on people with disability that may not be able to fully articulate themselves, you know, if we're talking about more severe disabilities. So there's the question, what can we measure and what can't be measured maybe? And I would like to ask uh, Charlotte about her approach to this topic. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think a lot of a lot can be uh, measured, but it's always a question of resources, and it might not be um, very uh, yeah um, useful to invest uh, a lot of money into really uh, um, pro uh, providing uh, causal evidence on um, like each uh, step in here. But um, I I know a lot of different um, I don't know different approaches to uh, also uh, show long term effects. For example, if you focus on quality of life and see how people um, develop in uh, and uh, in their you know uh, also. Um, uh, competencies uh, in different areas and how um, um, yeah how they um, adapt to life how they uh, yeah, feel good or, or uh, feel less good in in their um, especially if they for example uh, also uh, live in housing projects uh, where you um, have you know um, people with uh, different disabilities that cannot uh, that need a lot of uh, personal assistance and on the one hand, the goal is to you know have people in society, but for the moment in Germany, at least, it is the case that they are still uh, sheltered homes as well. And you um, want to not only you know focus on maybe short-term goals, but also on how people can participate with their um, means uh, in um, also um, designing their own lives. And this is a whole different approach in how we. Um, um, you know, get in contact with people and it's something which also uh, staff that works with people in uh, housing has to um, adopt a different mindset on. So we need box, uh, toolboxes that uh, uh, really um, uh, have uh, make it possible that uh, people participate themselves uh, and uh, um, that are adopted to different um, skill levels and uh, here there are specialist programs as well where there's peer feedback, for example, from uh, people with so-called uh, intellectual uh, disabilities that um, are evaluators themselves and go into uh, those sheltered homes and ask um, uh, questions themselves. So Nueva, it's called, it's a wide approach. And uh, so you really have this not for us, but we are the actors of our lives. Um, uh, this is what uh, we have to look for, and it costs money, but uh, I think it's uh, important to have this uh, in, uh, inclusive mindset as um, also a funder. Mm. Thanks so much, Charlotte. We will go a bit deeper into that question. Uh, I would hand over to Geza. Is there something uh, kind of an impact about the Institute for Inclusive Education that you think cannot be measured easily? but is important? On so many levels. <laughs> so, so at first, um, what's really interesting, we have universities who are usually more in a um, competition through our educational specialists because within each federal state, so, so for example, Laura and her colleagues, they are not only giving lecturers at this Kiel University, they also give lecturers and seminar at other regional university nearby. So those universities are more or less more in competition regarding students and research. They are now working together and we created some really interesting projects um, together, research together. So this is one thing I really like to, to take a closer look on. On the same level, we, we had a really huge German TV documentary about the three years people were, um, um, the, the camera was, was with them through the whole three year qualification in Cologne. Since this documentary is out in TV, we got so interesting um, questions from long-term, institutions who are since ages are working with people with disabilities and now they ask us how we can help them to empower people with disabilities like for example peer um, 
peer consultancy, like for example, living conditions. So we empower them and we consult them how to empower people with disabilities. So even though they are working with people with disability, they, they are really looking forward to this approach, not focusing on the deficits. Oh, my English, I'm so sorry. And, and <laughs> focusing on the competencies. So this is on the long run, I think, quite interesting um, and inspiring for us to go ahead with our work because people who are in this field, experts, and now coming to us and asking how how do you empower people with disabilities how can you what happened and then on the other hand i think um just short notice um if we had more resources we would like to look at the students more because changing mindset is so hard to to measure and we need long long-term studies to evaluate how they change the mindset if they take it to the jobs, how future teachers who had the experiences to have seminars with educational specialists, how those teachers are now working what's with their mindset. Thanks so much. These are so many different levels of impact actually, right? In, in how you work with stakeholders, how they are changing maybe their practices in the sector and, and how to capture, of course. Thanks so much. Let's go to the to the last question. We already started to talk about it. Uh, this relationship between an impact expert, you know, an external one, uh, working with a social enterprise and also working with uh, people with disabilities, you know, that are connected to the social enterprise or NGO. And sometimes, you know, in the past, this sometimes was also a top down approach, you know, you come with your concepts, your indicators, your uh, data collection instruments, and people have to fill in your questionnaires, and then you go and then you make conclusions. Uh, so and when I talked to Charlotte about this, you said you sense a bit of a paradigm shift in also how people with disabilities become part of the impact measurement. Uh, and how like external experts and you know program managers and people with disabilities can meet in different ways. Yeah, I think this this paradigm shift is uh, is really something that it is due and has been due for for a long time. That um, not only um, in the uh, analysis of impact uh, look at um, what, um, what you know opinions are, but that in the uh, on the very first start when you do your planning, um, uh, that uh, you you ask and do uh, people and uh, involve people that are um, the target group of your. Uh, um, your yeah, intervention. So um, to um, not like, um, you know, be the expert that knows what people want, but uh, to ask what people um, um, want themselves for themselves. And here um, you, it involves uh, more complex uh, evaluation designs, of course, uh, to um, uh, might uh, sound easier to just, you know, have someone, uh, you know, look from the outside and then make uh, um, uh, uh, conclusions about uh, how to improve this project, but that we won't uh, reach uh, an inclusive society if we if we don't um, uh, have an inclusive setup from the start. I think so. Uh, here um, to to um, you know empower people in the way uh, Giza has had to um, that's uh, you know, what, what's necessary in uh, to to really uh, put into action uh, your end rights uh, and. Um, I think a lot of uh, of those um, institutions that's been working for a long time, they are also uh, experts for a lot, a lot of aspects. So um, here um, we have to really use all our mind and power to um, make an inclusive society. And I, I know, for example, um, also in in, in Hamburg, um, uh, a lot of um, um, uh, actors that. Uh, really uh, involve people from the from the onset and um, um, in the planning cycle with uh, settings that involve different experts and uh, assistants uh, if necessary. And one thing is, I think that we also have to keep in mind is that in this case that you described, uh, Gisa, here uh, assi uh, assistance could be reduced, but in a lot of cases it will not, not be possible. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, rather that you require more assistance to uh, um, make give people a voice that might not communicate uh, verbally. Um, so uh, the uh, the idea that you can save costs uh, is not like, uh, one that can guide you in this aspect. Okay. 
Thanks so much. Important to point this out, you know, uh, inclusion, we need to focus on that. It may come even with additional costs, but if we are clear in what we want to achieve, it's necessary. A last question uh, to you, Geza. Were there moments where uh, your uh, pedagogical experts told you what they really want and what they really want to get out of this training, you know, where you also realized hmm, that it's maybe not what we thought of? Uh, is there something maybe uh, you remember? Maybe uh... I have to ask Laura. Um, well, um, I guess what was really interesting that um, we, I answer from a different angle. Um, in Cologne, we have one person who uses the talker to communicate. And I think this is something we learned the first qualification where Laura applied, the, the whole application, we, we thought, okay, what should people bring to become educational specialists? This was what, what we thought. For sure, we talked to people in workspaces, if they could help us, what, what, what we should take as skills or what, who can participate at such a qualification, without um, overwhelming someone. And nowadays we know the only two things people need if they want to become educational specialists is to be brave enough to leave a system and to can, you should imagine that you can talk about your own disability, mm. which is also quite brave, but you, you should have, Laura, perhaps you can assist. Um, you should have. Can you bring Laura? In? Passionate. You should be passionate about talking about yourself and one time. And this is what we try to figure out during the qualification. So I can't tell you there was something Laura and her colleagues told me they would have loved, learned this. I think what's really interesting, perhaps, Laura, if you would like to assist. Um, during the qualification, Laura, for example, is now someone who also wanted to do participatory research at university levels. So she was involved in a, in a project with another university and she was working as a researcher on her own. Laura, I don't know, do you want to add something? Um, yes, um, qualification was very excited for me um exciting i mean um and i have learned a lot of things that have made me richer inside because i learned another way of learning um because in learning at the qualification was so easy for me and so i felt really free inside and I would follow more to my own way and my heart and, and the most interesting thing has always been for me to um, talk with the students um, because the interaction and we're working together it makes my heart blossom like a flower and so um and so i hope that other people with disability uh, with disabilities will get um the possibility to to make a qualification to Thanks so much, Laura. Uh, it was great to, to have you being part of this, you know. Um, I would now uh, maybe give the audience the chance to ask some questions. We received some in the chat. And maybe I would ask Maria, she will be uh, the off voice to uh, say maybe the first question. Um, we have a few questions on the um, type of disability. So whether it's uh, moderate uh, or mild, and the employment profile of uh, people with intellectual disabilities who are trained in universities. Giza, could you take this question to explain a bit? 
Um, yes, so there was also the question about the, the term so-called intellectual disabilities. Let me answer both of them. Um, we say so-called intellectual disabilities because this is the term which is like a formal intellectual disabilities, but we are not really happy with this term and the experts in their own course sometimes would like to say we are people with so-called learning disabilities or we are people with disabilities and we don't want to go deeper and this leads me to the answer of the other question so we we dramatize to end dramatize so we 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 accelerate we use this term intellectual disabilities even though we know there should be a better term but we haven't found one yet mm. The other one is that um, there, there's a high variety of disabilities within the sheltered workshops. And these are the two worlds we want to bring together, the exclusive world of the sheltered workshops where people with disabilities are and the university. And that's why we have, it's hard to, to, to work with the term mild disabilities, but perhaps let's answer in this way that we have a high variety of disabilities. So for example, there are, there are people who, who use a talker and who need a lot of assistance. And there are people who, who perhaps this is also an important fact for all of you, sorry. Um, the whole qualification is competence oriented and centered on the person. So it's quite individual. Not everyone who's doing the qualification has the same material. We adapt the material towards able, enable people to, to get the qualification. That's why it's hard for me to answer this question. We have a high variety of different disabilities within all participants in, um, in the educational specialist qualification. And it's always hard to talk about it about people without them. So that's why Laura is there, but also Laura can talk for all her colleagues. So we have a high variety of different disabilities. I hope I answered the question. That's a, that's a good answer. Um, maybe you have a second question, Maria. Um, yes, maybe the um, interpreters can come in to translate the question from Adoración Juárez Sánchez. Um, otherwise, we have a question from um, Mauro uh, Tamayo, um, if you can tell us still together, please, more details about the impact generated by this uh, educational program. Yeah, I can I can go ahead on on the target groups. So the the big impact we have on students students who change their minds so are very grateful Laura perhaps you can you can tell about the interactions with students what kind of feedback you receive um, some students tell us that um, they have learned more about um, with a better way to work with um, pupils with disabilities or with other people with disabilities, um, not only for the school, because uh, sometimes we give lessons for future teacher, uh, teachers, um, but we give lessons for um, people from the culture area, for example, and um, so they can teach them about how to uh, do more for uh, for exhibitions um, to make them more um, barrier free. And the feedback we become is often that we have learned something new and that we can work with it better for the future. Thank you, Laura. This is such an important point I forgot. We also, we did not only train teachers, we train all people who in their future life will work with people. So we also train future policemen 
And they are so afraid sometimes of people with so-called intellectual disabilities, and they are so happy that they have the chance in a small seminar to also ask perhaps political non-correct questions in order to understand how to, how to interact with people with disabilities because they are not used to it. Thanks so much. Maybe we can also share in the follow up, make some more details on, on your impact model. We can compile that. We have time for one last question, Maria. Yeah, so we got the translation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you do have internships and if you have noted any differences between your university classmates and those doing internships. Um, and I'm not sure if, if I understand the question. Internships at the Institute for Inclusive Education? Maybe mandatory in the um, in the course or okay. No, we can we can collect the question, and maybe answer it. Um, let's try that. But uh, do we have do we have another question, maybe? Yeah, we have a question. How do you measure impacts which are qualitative? Maybe this was already slightly answered in the impacts that cannot be measured. But... Yeah, of course, there's this big uh, differentiation between what can be measured in terms of numbers, and what can we only, you know, describe qualitatively. Uh, maybe, uh, Charlotte, do you want to say something about this kind of uh, qualitative quantitative uh, differentiation and how you work with that yeah i think it's uh, um yeah uh, as you already said in the quantitative data you it's more what you can actually count so if you already know what you uh, what you want to achieve and what your impacts are you can then uh, find out how much or in in which uh, cases uh, this uh, it can be reached and if you on a qualitative level you are more in the process of finding out what all your um, you know impacts are things that either described as unintended uh, effects, for example, um, uh, to first find out also this in, in uh, interviews um, with the education uh, specialist or with the students um, on what levels uh, it all impacts uh, their from, uh, future life. So um, here is um, something which is more, you know, the, the non-measurable, um, but the, that what is more on, in, in terms of competitive competencies um yeah so thanks so much we are at the end of this webinar um i think we had a great example thanks so much Geza and laura for presenting uh the work and really also making us understand you know the the and the impact and thanks so much charlotte uh in the follow-up mail i think we we can also share the social impact navigator from fineo it's publicly available so this is a very comprehensive guide on how you can conceptualize your impact model and measure your impact it's one of the best that i know at least so uh, have a look and maybe uh, put into practice what you heard today um uh, i'm uh, will briefly share my screen again um Thanks so much for the speakers. We will stop your spotlight now. And I will just remind you uh, as a last piece today on the upcoming webinars. So I hope you like the experience today. We, of course, will uh, also improve it. Happy to receive your feedback. Um, so there will be uh, one webinar, public webinar on social business model and fundraising, you know, getting into the different options that social enterprises and NGOs have actually uh to to fundraise and you know create revenue but also with an outlook on how they scale their impact uh then we have global scaling strategies that is one core piece of our program that we are running for the zero project and then uh, a fun webinar at the end practice your pitch you can already register uh, for these webinars uh you will again receive the link uh to the web page where you find all registration links and that's it uh, for today. Thanks so much to all the participants for joining. Um, yeah, and please also use the chat maybe to say goodbye to the speakers, to the audience, to the community, and have a great morning, afternoon, depending <laughs> on where you are located. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I wait a bit for some of the messages to come in. Great. 
thanks also to our translators today. Uh, you did a, a great job. And also to Maria, uh, my tech and chat assistant. Uh, it was great uh, to have you. And yeah, and see you at the next occasion for our webinar series. Goodbye.